Oh, hi there. Today, I want to look at what's been lost in the world of comics. Lost comic strips, comic books, web comics, and even a web manga. Covering everything from last minute changes left on the cutting room floor, to long forgotten series, to abandoned web comics. Spanning from some of the most well known pieces of lost media to some of the most obscure I've ever come across. If I miss something, or if you have an idea for a future video, let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Lost Media Mike. So here are 20 lost comics. Twinkles, the new star shaped cereal in the storybook package. A few months ago, Alice Lost Media reached out to me on Twitter with some of the most obscure lost media I've heard in a long time. As a kid, I remember eating cereal in the morning and reading the back of the cereal box. Sometimes there was a maze, sometimes a crossword puzzle, and sometimes a story. I guess this is something kids for generations have experienced, because in 1960, General Mills released Twinkle's Cereal, and one of its big selling points, besides its star-shaped cereal, was that it came with short comics on the back of the box. But because there was no dedicated release of the comics, there's never been any real catalog to pull from, and preservation has become difficult. It's likely that some of the comics became permanently lost when the last cereal box was thrown away in the 60s. Along with the lost comics, General Mills also commissioned a tie-in animated series that's almost entirely lost. The show aired weekly on episodes of King Leonardo and his short subjects and Rocky and his friends. While these short animated segments were tacked on to popular TV shows, because the advent of home recording wasn't popular at the time, the serial being discontinued and the lack of a home media release, we're looking at about 30 adventures of Twinkle the Elephant that are lost. Whereas there's a chance that General Mills might have footage of the cartoon, and we do have a catalog of all the missing episodes, we don't even know how many cereal box comics were made, and I seriously doubt General Mills has 60 year old cereal boxes laying around from a long discontinued brand. So it seems the only hope of recovery for these comics is on the shoulders of dedicated fans like Alice Lost Media. The Superman before Superman became an iconic household name, creators Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster made two other versions of the character before landing on 1938's massively influential Action Comics No. 1. The first version of the character came from their 1933 short story, The Reign of the Superman. Basically, the only similarities between this Superman and the Superman we know today is the name. The 1933 version was a villain who was temporarily given superpowers by a mad scientist and he uses them for evil. After the reign of the Superman, Siegel and Schuster reworked their character into a crime-fighting hero in their new comic simply titled The Superman. Initially the duo, still in high school at the time, planned to have their comic published by Consolidated Book Publishing, but the company backed out of their agreement. After being rejected by other publishing companies, Joe Schuster tore up the Superman comic and threw it in a fire. Only the cover survived. Following the success of the character, fans attempted to track down this legendary comic, contacting publishers that Schuster and Siegel sent copies to, but none could find it in their archives, meaning that one of the earliest Superman comics was lost forever to teenage frustration in 1933. Tickets, please. Dude, I'm sure you've got, like, so many tickets at this point. Jesus, the tickets please guy is cut. He, he's, he's got those things. What do you call them? The, um, I'm gutters. What? Justin Roiland's Comic Sacrifice Prior to reaching widespread fame with Rick and Morty, series co-creator Justin Roiland got his start selling comics in high school called Comic Sacrifice. The only evidence I can find on the internet of these obscure comics come from a 2009 Reddit post by Mildly Annoyed Penguin providing a few details along with the cover of the first issue. Penguin claims they got this picture from someone on Facebook who deleted their account and that Justin would sell comics to other students in his high school. Based on the cover, it's issue number one and the comic is dated Summer 1998. That summer, Justin would have been 18 so he liked likely sold the comics at the end of his time in high school or post-graduation. Royland's comic sacrifice would later evolve into a production company that created comic books, comic strips, movies, and cartoons, including the viral House of Cosby series. But from my research, there are no copies of Comic Sacrifice issue number one on the internet, and it's unknown if there are more early issues that were made. I would love to get a hold of these early comics of Justin Royland and see the progression of his brilliantly creative mind. I know the way. Yes, I do. do you know the way? I know the way. You have to have a bulla to know the way. Archie's Sonic the Hedgehog. Archie Comics' Sonic the Hedgehog is the longest running video game comic adaptation running from 1992 to 2016 with an impressive 260 issues. The series is often compared to a soap opera, with its complicated character relationships, winding narrative, and dramatic telling of the adventures of Sonic and his friends. One of the driving forces behind the series' trademark drama was Ken Penders. Upon joining the franchise in 1994, Penders began expanding greatly on the roster of characters with his own original creations and delving deep 
deeply into the backstories of established characters, particularly Sonic's frequent ally, part-time enemy, Knuckles. Penders would eventually take control of nearly every aspect of the comic, taking on the role of writer, artist, pencils, inks, colors, and letters. This demand for control seems to have led to a power struggle that resulted in Penders leaving the comic in 2009, after which he sued both Sega and Archie Comics over the use of his characters he made for the series. This kind of lawsuit seems frivolous and something that major companies would account for in their contracts, but after years of legal battles, it became apparent that because of poorly written and strangely worded documents, Penders actually had legal standing. Sometime in 2012 and 2013, Penders would be awarded legal rights to the characters he created for Sega and Archie, and in the aftermath, would force the company to make changes to their 2013 story arcs, Endangered Species, and Chaotix Quest. In order not to have to pay Penders for the use of his characters, all original creations were expunged from the various issues at the last minute, forcing rewrites and new artwork, leaving a good chunk of the comic on the cutting room floor, and because of legal issues surrounding Ken's work, the original Endangered Species and Chaotic Quest art and storylines have likely been destroyed or buried in bureaucratic red tape, with only a handful of panels surviving. These behind-the-scenes events would have massive implications for the comic as a whole, triggering a chain of events that would eventually lead to the entire Archie Sonic universe to be rebooted. And just a few years later, Sega ended their partnership with Archie Comics, with some blaming Ken Penders as the first domino to fall, leading to its cancellation. Whatever happened to Moxie? The Moxie Show was one of the first shows ever produced by Cartoon Network. First airing in 1993, The Moxie Show was made up of classic cartoons interspersed with 3D cartoons featuring Moxie and his friends. While there are 22 lost episodes of The Moxie Show itself, the show also led to a single comic in 2000 that has since gone missing. Ironically, in the comic, Moxie was missing and readers had to choose what happened to him next, and the most popular answer would appear in the next issue. Since this was the last thing to officially be released for the Moxie series, it could be considered considered the series finale. From the lost comic, only the first panel of the 15-page work has been preserved. You do too much. College, a job, all this time with me. You're not Superman, you know. <laughs> Jack Kirby at DC Comics. Jack Kirby is one of Marvel Comics' most legendary figures, being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Steve Ditko and the omnipresent Stan Lee, credited as the creative force behind the Fantastic Four, Iron Man, the Hulk, the X-Men, Thor, and Black Panther, but he also created the Justice League villain Darkseid. How he ended up creating characters for Marvel's bitter rival DC would come about in the 70s due to poor treatment from Marvel. Kirby's biographer, Mark Evanier, claims that Marvel dismissed the contributions of Kirby, seeing Stan Lee as the true genius behind the company's success. During his tenure at DC, Kirby would create the Fourth World storyline, an epic saga of mythology, science fiction, and biblical influences, with Darkseid as the central villain. This seemed like a good fit considering Kirby's work on Thor, but issues arose when it came time for Kirby to draw Superman in the series Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. A reluctant and likely nervous Kirby brought his own unique art style to the character, with some minor yet important changes. Kirby's take on the Man of Steel saw a redesigned S logo, an even more rigid jaw, and a less defined curly Q hairstyle. DC did not like Kirby's redesign, and had Superman artists Al Placino and Murphy Anderson draw over Kirby's work to give the character a more traditional feel. Some of Kirby's work on Superman still exists, but because it was drawn over, most of his take on the iconic superhero is lost forever. C. Martin Crocker's Forbidden File C. Martin Crocker is best known for his animation work on Space Ghost Coast to Coast and Aqua Teen Hunger Force, along with voicing some of their characters like Zorak, Moltar, and Dr. Weird. In 2016, Crocker died of unknown causes, but even before his passing, there was a long-standing rumor that Crocker kept a plethora of not-safe-for-work comics known as the Forbidden Folder. These forbidden cartoons are just rumors, but they've basically been confirmed by those close to Crocker, along with Crocker's own sister, Julie Thornton. But half a decade after his passing, the Forbidden Folder hasn't been leaked. Only one image has emerged, with some claiming it's from the Forbidden Folder, but this has never been verified. Oh, I want eat, 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 eat until I die. Carl Barks Cut Comics in the early days of Disney, writer and artist Carl Barks made a name for himself working on Donald Duck comics, being nicknamed the Good Duck Artist, eventually creating characters like Scrooge McDuck and other inhabitants of Duckburg. 
Barks would go on to produce 693 stories between 1942 and 1994. Just like in the case of Jack Kirby at DC, Carl Barks' work was edited and censored over the course of his 50 plus year career at Disney. Some of his censored artwork has been unearthed and preserved, but there still remain a huge number of story arcs and artwork removed from his comics that are still lost. There are way too many to talk about right now, so here are some of the greatest hits. 1943's Lifeguard Days, where Disney demanded the bust of a lady duck to be reduced. This can be seen in the final artwork, where there's an unnatural gap between the two, and the original artwork of the duck memories have never been recovered. Published in One Shots 108 in 1946, the firebug sees Donald becoming a pyromaniac after a head injury, as one does. Fires start all over the city and Huey, Dewey, and Louie try to find out if it was really because of Donald. They find out Donald did not cause the fires, but rather a firebug who is then arrested. In the original story, the fires were started by Donald and he gets arrested with the final panel showing Donald in jail. The editors didn't like the ending, so they scrapped the last two panels, changing the ending to be just a dream. And the last one was meant to be published in September 1952 in Walt Disney Comics and Stories 144. The story, called Golden Apples, was a parody of Atlanta and the Golden Apples around Donald and Daisy. The editors scrapped the entire comic with one of the main reasons cited that Daisy wasn't feminine enough. It's, it's, a, it's a duck. It's a cartoon. Because she threw apples at Donald when he tried to impress other lady ducks. The story was shelved and never released and Barks says he doesn't even remember the details of the comic. But unlike Barks' other lost comics, in 2007 another Donald Duck cartoonist made a recreation of Barks' lost work. Igdoof by Jeff Kinney. Before his breakthrough children's novel, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, cartoonist Jeff Kinney published his comic strip, Igdoof, from 1989 to 1993 in the campus newspapers of Villanova University and the University of Maryland. The comics followed the eponymous Igdoof, a college freshman who's modeled after Kinney if he had no filter and said exactly what he was thinking. After its college run, he tried to get the comics into newspapers. After being rejected, he made some changes and turned them into a book. Diary of a Wimpy Kid. The comics share many similarities to Diary of a Wimpy Kid, mainly in some of the reused characters. The character Buster became Greg, the main character of Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Igdoof's brother was used as Greg's brother, Manny, and Ugly Eugene and Pushfa, the Green Bean, were used in both. Not much is known about these comics outside of a biography about Jeff Kinney, and only a handful of the comic strips have been released. It's unknown how many were made. Kiwis by Beat. Kiwis by Beat are a series of webcomics by Ryan Armand on the website of the same name. The comics were typically dark, unnerving works spanning the comedy and drama genres. Though Armand's work never reached a mainstream audience, he did receive critical acknowledgement with his webcomic Minus being nominated for Best Digital Comic at the 2007 Eisner Awards. For whatever reason, in 2016, after over a decade of releasing comics, Armand let the website expire and seemingly disappeared from the internet. Hardcore fans were able to archive the majority of the comics, but five series have missing elements. The series Socks is almost entirely lost, with only two of its 468 chapters having been recovered. The Thing in the Water, a story about a monster that abducts children, turning them into puppets, has three chapters archived, but the total length of the series is unknown, so we're not clear how much is missing. The story Fist has 32 of its 89 pages recovered. Modern Fried Snakes, a grim look at a fictional Asian community, has only 10 pages missing, but the comics were left unfinished when the website expired and Ribbled Youth. All the comics have been found, but the supplemental material from the website are lost, like the results from character quizzes, short supplemental comics, and blog posts with original art. The missing chapters and pages from these comics do have a chance of being found, and maybe someday Ryan Armand will return with his missing content. If you're out there, Ryan, we're ready to welcome you back whenever you're ready. Little Nemo in Slumberland Windsor McKay's character, Little Nemo, originally appeared in Dream of the Rarebit Fiend before getting his own spin-off, Little Nemo in Slumberland. Slumberland would be published on and off for three runs from 1905 to 1926 by the New York Herald and the New York American. The comics were weekly, color, full-page stories throwing Nemo into bizarre, surreal, and unsettling dreams in Slumberland. Each comic ends with Nemo waking up in his bed from his fantastical dream. The comic strip has gone on to be praised as a masterpiece of experimental color and perspective in the medium, and would go on to be influential to greats like Walt Disney and lead to a huge number of adaptations, including an opera, stage plays, movie adaptations, an NES game, and an upcoming Netflix adaptation. 
Along with McKay's original artwork for the comic being lost, having been destroyed in a fire in the 30s, the final run of the comic from 1924 to 1926 has not been released to the public since its first print. Unlike the other entries on this list, this one might not be lost at all. The comics are held at the Library of Congress but are not accessible to the public, so until they're released, we can't know the extent to which the run is preserved. You'll pull it away and I'll land flat on my back and kill myself. Peanuts, October 2nd, 1955. Peanuts are probably the most iconic comic strip in history, and besides being just great comics, they've been published in over 2,600 newspapers in 21 different languages, have led to classic TV specials, a CGI movie, created a billion dollar franchise, and the character Snoopy is just about as recognizable as Mickey Mouse and Hello Kitty. Running for 50 years from 1950 to 2000, written and illustrated by Charles M. Schultz, the series is arguably the longest story ever told by a single person. Google seems to think so. Because these comics are so important and have been published worldwide, they've been well preserved. With one single exception. Occasionally Schultz would make longer comic strips than the standard four panels. Usually publishers would remove some of the panels to make them fit in the newspaper. These cut panels have all been released in various collections in 2004 and 2016. But in the October 2nd, 1955 comic strip, there is one single panel that has never been recovered. For whatever reason, no one can seem to find the opening title card panel, and in all releases, a generic title has been drawn in to fill in the only missing piece of the longest story ever told. Overwatch First Strike Based on the popular hero shooter, Overwatch First Strike was a cancelled comic meant for a 2016 release. The franchise has released a number of comics, mostly delving into individual characters, but this 100-page graphic novel by Dark Horse Comics, written by Mickey Nielsen and illustrated by Ludo Lullaby, was meant to give a backstory to the founding of Overwatch during the Omnic Crisis. In 2017, former Overwatch director Jeff Kaplan explained First Strike's cancellation, saying that the graphic novel's story would have limited the series' creativity and forced the team to follow a set narrative. In his own words, there's a lot going on in Overwatch right now where I think that the story in players' heads is often even cooler than what we can deliver to them. Of the 100-page work, the cover, promo art, and only three pages have been released without text. Based on their nearly finished state, there are surely more pages that Blizzard has yet to release. The Silent Hill Graphic Novel The same year as the release of the original Silent Hill, a 70-page graphic novel was created, planned for a release in late 1999. The comic was written by John Murphy and illustrated by Neil Goog, and according to Goog's DeviantArt page, he was given six months to do the art for the 70-page graphic novel that was never released, though completely finished. The graphic novel was meant to have a standalone release and to be bundled with the special edition of Silent Hill 2, but was cancelled due to conflict between Konami and its European branch. In 2021, Goog revealed that all of the work for the comic was stored on a CD that has since been lost. Parts of the comic have made their way to the Silent Hill fan site, Silent Hill Memories, where you can find all that remains of the Silent Hill graphic novel. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, The Forever Wars Along with Sonic, Archie Comics also published the comic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures from 1988 to 1995. The comics initially followed the 1987 TV show, but after a few issues, they began to diverge into darker and more serious topics. The 72-issue run was meant to conclude with a five-part arc titled The Forever Wars that had the Turtles traveling to a dark future where Shredder was a totalitarian leader. But according to writer Stephen Murphy, the story was too dark, and when he told his editors about it, they quote, popped their two pays. The arc was replaced with a story about how the turtles got their weapons, a rather unsatisfying ending for a comic that took itself so seriously. Murphy has tried to get the comic released for years, announcing its release in 05, 07, and 09, which is kind of funny because a similar story was told in the 2005 Turtles episode, same as it never was. Since its cancellation, six pages and the cover for each issue has been released. In 2019, a Russian-based group recreated the first two lost episodes based on the released material. Waku Waku Poppin' Manga Waku Waku Poppin' Manga was a comic series published on the now-defunct Konami Net DX mobile site, based on the Poppin' Music video game series. The site was one of those old-school sites, only accessible on mobile phones, where you could pay to download backgrounds, ringtones, video games, and in this case, comic books. When the Konami site closed in 2016, nearly every single one of the 934 four-page Waku Waku comics were lost. In 2008, Poppin' Music magazine released five issues that would include a few of the Waku Waku comics. This is the only known physical release of the comics. 
Gambit, the hunt for the Tomorrow Stones. In 1996, Marvel introduced their first attempt at webcomics, Marvel's Cyber Comics. And just to demonstrate how old this service was, all comics were originally exclusive to the AOL web portal. The webcomics were cancelled in 2000 and succeeded by Marvel Digital Comics Unlimited in 2007. But before closing, they released a decent number of comics focusing on Spider-Man, the X-Men, and also comics highlighting individual X-Men like Wolverine and Gambit. Gambit, The Hunt for the Tomorrow Stones is notable for being the first Marvel webcomic advertised in a print edition. It was this print ad that got fans interested in the Gambit comic, but it soon became apparent that the webcomic was missing. The book was illustrated by Derek Gross Sr., who was able to provide some of the original black and white artwork. According to John Cirilli, Marvel's Vice President of Content and Programming, Marvel does not have any of their early webcomics. From my understanding, all other cyber comics have been preserved in their Flash format. Such insignificant creatures. They dare steal from Galactus. The Last Galactus Story Along with Jack Kirby, John Lindy Byrne is another unsung hero of Marvel Comics who defected to DC for a time. During his career, he gave us some great runs of the X-Men, Fantastic Four, She-Hulk, and is credited with creating characters like Kitty Pryde, Scott Lang, and Sabretooth, along with the 1986 relaunch of DC's Superman. In 84, Byrne was working on the Galactus story under Marvel's Epic Illustrated, a label that allows for more graphic content. From 84 to 86, Byrne and inker Terry Austin made nine installments of the Galactus story, expecting to release a tenth, but because of how expensive the comics were to make and low sales, the Epic Illustrated label was discontinued, leaving the last chapter of the Galactus story unpublished. The series takes place millions of years in the future, following Galactus and Nova as they try to discover what's behind the destruction of multiple galaxies, with Chapter 9 ending on a cliffhanger where the duo discover it was a rogue watcher. Byrne says that the final issue was to have Galactus dying, releasing all of his energy causing the Big Bang, transforming Nova into the Galactus of the new universe. No artwork from the cancelled comic has been released, and Byrne has since forgotten the exact details of the story, leaving one of Marvel's most epic stories untold. Introducing Super Stretchy Superhero Stretch Armstrong. Yes, Stretch Armstrong. Now stretching fun farther than ever before. The Origins of Stretch Armstrong. In 1976, Kemmer Products introduced their rubbery action figure, Stretch Armstrong. The toy's initial run lasted from 1980 when it was discontinued, but has since gone through numerous revivals. In the 90s, Stretch Armstrong was relaunched, and certain editions of Stretch came with a comic delving into the character's origin story, showing Armstrong trying to find his long-lost father and becoming part of a crime-fighting team. But outside of that, not much is known about the story, because the comic cannot be found. The toy rights were eventually bought by Hasbro, and because everything needs to be a multimedia franchise, they turned Stretch Armstrong into a TV show and a movie has been in the works for years, with actors like Tim Allen and Danny DeVito attached to the project. The first and last pages of the comic have made their way online, and in 2019 a Twitter user posted pictures of the comic, and it's believed they might be in possession of the entire work, though they haven't responded to my attempts at contact. Right now, they seem like our best bet at recovering the lost comic of Stretch Armstrong. He's alive. He's alive. You're gonna be alright, son. Batman, A Death in the Family, Robin Lives After the first iteration of Robin, Dick Grayson moved on from the mantle, DC introduced Jason Todd to become the new Robin in 1983. Fans reacted negatively to the new character, and in 1988, DC made the bold choice to kill off Todd in the infamous A Death in the Family story. In the penultimate episode, the Joker beats Jason Todd and leaves him to die in an explosion. To generate publicity, at the end of the comic, fans were given a chance to call a 1-800 number to decide if the Joker kills Robin or if he lives. Despite the perceived dislike of the character, readers chose to let Robin die by a very thin margin, a matter of just 72 votes from over 10,000 calls. Some put into question the validity of the 1-800 number, believing it to be theatrics behind a decision that was already made. But this has seemingly been disproven, as various work-in-progress panels have been made public showing an alternate version where Robin survives. Originally, DC only released a single, uncolored page from the alternate comic until 2020's Robin Week, where they released a second page, though this one is unfinished. This implies that the alternate ending was not finished, meaning that the comic is no longer lost, simply incomplete. Until DC admits there's more unreleased material, I'm content to close the case on the Robin Lives ending of A Death in the Family.
Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if there are any other lost comics I missed or if there are any topics you want me to cover. You can find me in the comments or on Twitter at Lost Media Mike. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.